And so ask her, I know it's working in here. So, I'm old. Thank you very much. I actually brought notes this time because I used to do this without notes and I didn't want to it up. So, you've already seen posters for this talk or know about it. How do I know that? You are sitting here. And based on today, thank you very much. And I'm not commenting about the weather because we have a field trip Saturday. So that's off the boat. So welcome back to the geology lecture series at SWAC. It's been 20 months and I've been looking at some of you and I know that you're gonna contact me later and say, no, it's actually been 19 months, 27 days and 29 minutes now. Not that anybody's counting. And as people trickle in, that's why we have introductions. So this is the first geology talk, certainly not this first science lecture, in the Umpqua Hall Audit Auditorium, our new health and sciences building. And our speaker tonight is Dr. Wynn McLaughlin. Wynn completed an undergraduate degree in environmental science at University of Pacific. And the reason for that was basically to be able to combine a little bit of geology and a little bit of biology. And we'll see a little bit of that tonight. Following that, she did her graduate work at the University of Oregon, receiving an MS and a PhD. And this was followed by a Fulbright scholarship in Kyrgyzstan. In addition to teaching classes and labs at the U of O, uh, she also participated teaching in the U of O's uh, summer field camp, which is a pretty serious deal for geologists transitioning into graduate school. And also one that I really liked is a program called Nearby Nature. And Nearby Nature is a summer camp in Eugene that basically works with city kids and tries to expose them to the natural world. Now, I actually, from where I'm from and kind of where Wynn has been in the past, Eugene and city kind of, I found that a little bit humorous, but it is. There's a bunch of, of young people that don't get into the outdoors, and so that program is designed to make them aware of their surroundings. Uh, Wynn has taught at Oberlin, some of you may have heard of that in Ohio, as well as Occidental and Pomona College uh, in LA. And outside the traditional classroom, she also was a field scientist for applied earthworks and also a paleontologist in the park at John Day Fossil Beds, as well as Hagerman Fossil Beds. And just over one year, and I didn't actually do the days, hours, and, and minutes, but uh, one day before the start of winter term last year, and we're just into week two of winter term this year, uh, Wynn started teaching here at SWAC as our full-time geology professor. So, welcome back to the geology lecture series. Wynn gets to choose if she's gonna share any information about her future plans with that, but please join me with a warm welcome tonight for our speaker and your new geology lecture here series host, Dr. Wynn McLaughlin. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Wynn. Thank you for the lovely introduction, Ron. Basically, I got to be here because Ron finally mostly retired. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you about whales, which y'all saw in the title and came here. Uh, I'm rather new to studying whales. So this will be a little bit of a fun journey looking at the biology, the geology associated with fossil whales, as well as the very deep historical connection to whales in Oregon. Normally, my main expertise in paleontology is I work on large mammals with hooves. That actually has a connection to whales, which we'll get to, but generally it doesn't. Places like Kyrgyzstan, where I did my PhD work, it's entirely landlocked, not great for whales. And then my master's work was in the exact middle of Oregon, near the town of Post. 
There's a post in the center of Oregon that says post. <laughs> Not great places for whales either. So if you wanna talk about rhinos ever, that's my really nerdy, terrible claim to fame as I'm in the top five world experts on fossil rhinos. <laughs> There's only about five people who work on fossil rhinos. <laughs> And this is actually the one picture I could find of me with a whale. This is a false killer whale skull. And despite the lovely sunshine and my very smiling, happy face, hopefully you can tell by the super dorky clothing that it's really cold out. This was in the Falkland Islands off the tip of South America. So this is my one time of getting to play around with whales until moving here. So I wanna start off with a question for all of you. The title of my talk is Whales of the Oregon Coast. What do you think of when you hear that? Pause a second, consider Whales of the Oregon Coast. <laughs> Maybe those of you that aren't degenerates, like me, think about things like whale watching. This is an enormous dri driver of commerce on the entire Oregon coast. It's surprisingly hard to find numbers, so if anyone's really into stats and looking at commerce data, there's a niche out here where papers could be published. I found one published paper on California whale watching and no stats on Oregon. From what I could steal out of other papers, because I love stats and data, Whale watching as an industry globally generates $2.1 billion a year. Whales are big money in addition to big mammals. The best estimates I could get looking at little bits and pieces of numbers here is even coming out of COVID, this is a $20 million industry in Oregon. And that's also, I think, probably in a way, an underestimate of how important whales are to the Oregon coast. Because if somebody comes to Oregon to go whale watching, what else are they doing? They're staying in hotels and eating food and shopping and drinking and going to all these other places and investing in the Oregon coast. So this will be one of our take home messages, thank a whale. This is also a big driver of tourism here. I mean, you know, not only the money, but during peak season, that was something I could find data on, is state parks track how many people come during some of the whale watching events. And during peak season, there is a thousand plus people coming to state parks in Oregon just to see whales. Lovely brochure from the Oregon park system. In fact, in these brochures and various information produced by our Oregon State Parks, we have all of these different places that are designated as official whale watching and whale counting uh, stations. So during our sort of peak two times a year, mid-December to mid-January, we're at the tail end of that, and then late February through May, we have so many whales coming by the coast each of these individual points, they count how many whales they can see. That's obviously only during daylight, so imagine how many whales might be getting missed going by at night. There are even live YouTube cameras now at several of these points. So if you really, really want to get into whale watching, you can bring this up live, coming up and watch as gray whales especially come by on their migration. If we go up the coast a little ways, which some of our geology field trips do, another thing that's great to join in, the Depot Bay area has a official whale watching center. They are the organization that then coordinates the counts that are done at all of these other localities. And again, they have people stationed at each of these state parks counting the number of whales that go by. This is really important because I just hopefully sold you on whales are a really important economic driver for the Oregon coast. We kind of want them to do well. And we are actually very concerned with numbers. Gray whales, our main whale we're going to see off the Oregon coast, spent quite a long time on the endangered species list. They are one of our big successes in that they are one of the few animals 
that was on the endangered species list and has been delisted because their populations have recovered a fair amount. However, our estimates pre-industrial scale whaling are that we're still actually only at about 10 to 20 percent of whale populations pre-whaling. That's not super high. There's also been some concerning trends like the number of deceased whales washing up on beaches in the last several years. So counting whales, as sort of silly as that sounds, is actually really good for business. We want to know what's going on. And again, you can go along on geology field trips. We don't quite stop here, but it's a great one to go to on your own. If you go on geology field trips, you can see things like my terrible cell phone picture, where that's a whale, believe it or not. It was very close, we could see it. We sort of badly ignored Ron while the whale was doing cool whale things. And Ron talked about rocks, sorry Ron. Geology also rocks. If we take this a little further af afield, not just financial incentives to like whales, whales are a really big part of our sort of cultural identity living on the coast here. If I type into Google image search, Coos Bay logo, one of the things that comes up, of course, for sale, is this lovely little, you can buy it in stickers and posters and bags and you name it. Coos Bay and a whale. If you're driving into North Bend, you might have seen our brand new, really cool mural that was just painted. Uh, my fun kind of personal connection is this is a slightly modified version of a local artist's work that was very popular in the early 1990s. And the first time I actually came to Coos Bay was my first grade spring break. And I got a really cool t-shirt that looked exactly like that. I was super sad when I outgrew it. We even have our local Oregon Coast Music Festival. I had to pick one of the posters with whales, but I'd say like a third of the posters feature whales as this really iconic set of animals that we have here locally. This is our sort of identity we associate with the coast. And this is because we have this fairly amazing diversity of whales living off the coast. This was pulled from that same Oregon State Parks whale watching guide. And these are some of the more common possible whales to see. This is the biology part of the talk along our Oregon coast. In this case, ranked not by how common they are, but by size. And I just want to point out that when they say, oh, look at this cute little guy, that's still 30 feet long. Whales are really, really large. We do actually have a fair amount of blue whale sightings off the coast of Oregon, and this is a giant animal, the largest animal to have ever lived. That, that's remarkable. We tend to only see this tiny little bit here, so it can be kind of hard to associate and judge just how giant these animals are, but hopefully we'll, we'll get to that a little bit more. By far and away, our most common whales here along the coast are these gray whales. So the gray whales do this amazing migration where they spend part of the year down in the Gulf of Mexico or Hawaii, depending on the population, and then they migrate all the way up to the Arctic Circle. They're following basically where there's good sources of food, but also you don't want to have your babies in places that are really, really cold generally. This is part of why we get some differences in our southbound migration. Females tend to want to get down to the coast a little faster. Males are a little slower on the, I mean, maybe that's cross species. But uh, it's estimated between 18,000 and 25,000 gray whales pass Oregon every year. And again, this is 10 to 20% of our pre-whaling population thinking about how many whales there used to be, how common it would have been to see whales off the Oregon coast. Our second most common whale here are humpbacks. And this particular picture is actually at the mouth of Coos Bay. Very rarely, not super commonly, they will come in and investigate areas, even where there's a fair amount of fresh water coming in. In the 1980s and early 90s, there was a famous humpback whale that kept coming into San Francisco Bay in California. 
and swimming up things like the Sacramento River. <laughs> it got lost. They had to get a boat and play whale sounds to guide it back to the ocean. And then the next year it came back and did it again. <laughs> they are very, very intelligent animals. I mean, I'm not great at directions either, so like, we'll give it a break. Our next most third common whale are actually orcas. And we already had a great little pre-talk discussion of what is a whale? How many of you have heard orca whales aren't whales, they're dolphins? Yeah, most of you. Okay, what's a dolphin? Somebody define dolphin. If you want to make biologists argue, ask them to define whale and dolphin, and then we can really make it messy and throw in porpoises. If we take scientific names, our way of organizing and trying to figure out what's related to what, all of those things fall within cetacea. So I'm a little bit of a like science name anarchist, and that like, eh, it's a whale. It's part of cetacea, good enough. Technically, a subgroup within this family is the dolphiny things and orca whales are the largest member of the dolphin -y thing. But as we get into the fossils, it gets grayer and more confusing, and, and really the only distinction that kind of seems to matter in whales is do you have teeth or not? That's a teeth one, the top two are no teeth ones. Even the fossils are gonna get messy on that though. Does the whale have teeth? Ooh, we'll get to that. <laughs> Right now, thank you for the, I, I did not pay him to. On our more rare whales, uh, this is, I apologize that it is a little bit of a sad picture, it's dead, but this was uh, on, um, I just blanked on the beach, but really close to the Peter Iredale uh, up the coast, North Oregon, in late January of last year. And being a nerd, I drove up the coast to go see a dead whale. And it was determined that this poor sperm whale was actually hit by a boat, and that's why it ended up dead on the beach. Now, we had this great question about sperm whale and teeth. Well, it's complicated. Lower jaw, sharp, pointy teeth, great for grabbing onto squid. Top jaw, those are holes, they're not teeth. They do not have teeth on their upper jaws, only on their lower jaws that fit into holes in the top. That's weird. Like, giant mammal nerd, anatomy nerd here, I don't know of any other mammal that's like that. In the entire diversity, not only of mammals around today, but mammals in the fossil record. It's really great for holding on to giant squid, though. Squid, slippery, large, strong, not maybe the easiest thing to eat, but if you have a hole that your tooth sockets into, that's really hard for a squid to get out of. There was just a very cool video that came out of the Azores Islands of a paddleboarder videoed a sperm whale surfacing near the surface, and there is a giant squid tentacle still attached to the top of its head. <laughs> sperm whales are pretty rare. We know they're out there because they periodically wash up on the beaches, but they're actually, despite all of the strangeness of them, a whale we know very, very little about. If you Google pictures of sperm whales, there's often really neat pictures of them sitting totally vertically in the water, tail down, head up, in a group, we don't know why. Here's this giant animal, and it does weird behavior that we have no idea why yet, and really weird anatomy. Now, sperm whales look downright normal compared to one of our other rare visitors in Oregon. These are a group of whales called beaked whales. You get an infographic because there's very, very, very few photographs of them. This is a group of whales found all over the world. We have four different flavors here off the coast of Oregon. And yeah, we know almost nothing about them. Occasionally, one washes up dead and a bunch of biologists run out and study it as much as they can. 
and everything else we know about them is from the sounds they make. We only even know that we have these four because they've been recorded by the Coast Guard. This one has washed up once on the coast of Oregon. They live really, really deep in water, and the part where they get totally strange is they're called beaked whales because males have one really, really wide tooth on either side of their lower jaw that as they age grows up and over their top jaw, making it so they can't fully open their mouths. They eat krill, so they just sort of suck in water, but it still seems like not a great idea. Again, take home messages, whales are weird. And again, I'm a little bit of an anarchist with how we classify animals. If we take cetacea to mean whales, we actually also have eight different kinds of dolphins and porpoises that live off the coast of Oregon. Some of them are a little more standard, things like our aptly named common dolphin, which we have both long and short-snouted common dolphins here. It looks like a dolphin. Some of them are actually very strange, though. Uh, right whale dolphins don't have a dorsal fin. If you ask somebody to draw a dolphin, that's a pretty key part normally. Nope. And despite not having a dorsal fin, or maybe because of it, nobody's done the research, these guys are famous for, uh, of their sort of size dolphin, they can jump the farthest out of the water. They are documented jumping 25 feet straight up into the air. That's far. It is possibly a way to get away from orcas, who like to eat them. The killer whale part. Now, this is our little biology review of our whales on the Oregon coast, whale watching, all of this in arts and cultures. But if you've been in Oregon for a while, or again, you appreciate the world's best video, this might be what you think of. In 1970, uh, the Oregon Department of Transportation had a slightly questionable idea. It had to be said, the Oregon State Highway Division not only had a whale of a problem on its hands, it had a stinking whale of a problem. What to do with one 45-foot, 8-ton whale dead on arrival on the beach near Florence? It had been so long since a whale had washed up in Lane County, nobody could remember how to get rid of one. In selecting its battle plan, the Highway Division decided the carcass couldn't be buried because it might soon be uncovered. It couldn't be cut up and then buried because nobody wanted to cut it up, and it couldn't be burned. So dynamite it was, some 20 cases or a half ton of it. The hope was that the long dead Pacific gray whale would be almost disintegrated by the blast and that any small pieces still around after the explosion would be taken care of by seagulls and other scavengers. Indeed, the seagulls had been standing nearby all day. As everything was being made ready, we asked George Thornton, the highway engineer in charge of the project, for his final observation. Well, I'm confident that it'll work. The only thing is we're not sure just exactly how much uh, explosives it'll take to disintegrate this thing so the scavengers, seagulls, and crabs and whatnot can clean it up. Is there any chance it might be more than a one-day job? Uh, if there's any large chunks left, and uh, we may have to do some other cleanup, possibly set another charge. The dynamite was buried primarily on the leeward side of the big mammal, so as most of the remains would be blown toward the sea. About 75 bystanders, most of them residents who had first found the whale to be an object of curiosity before they tired of its smell, were moved back a quarter of a mile away. The sand dunes there were covered with spectators and land lubber newsmen shortly to become land blubber newsmen, with a blast blasted blubber beyond all believable bounds. The camera stopped rolling immediately after the blast. 
The humor of the entire situation suddenly gave way to a run for survival as huge chunks of whale blubber fell everywhere. Pieces of meat passed high over our heads while others were falling at our feet. The dunes were rapidly evacuated as spectators escaped both the falling debris and the overwhelming smell. A parked car over a quarter of a mile from the blast site was the target of one large chunk. The passenger compartment literally smashed. Fortunately, no human was hit as badly as the car. However, everyone on the scene was covered with small particles of dead whale. As for the success of the effort, the seagulls who were supposed to clean things up were nowhere in sight, either scared away by the explosion or kept away by the smell. That didn't really matter. The remaining chunks were of such a size that no respectable seagull would attempt to tackle anyway. As darkness began to set in, the highway crews were back on the beach burying the remains, including a large piece of the carcass which never left the blast site. It might be concluded that should a whale ever wash ashore in Lane County again, those in charge will not only remember what to do, they'll certainly remember what not to do. This has become really embedded in Oregon culture. I'm very pleased how many of you have already seen it, but I mean, you can't see this video too many times. It's, I will argue, one of the greatest. And in fact, this is such a big deal in our cultural identity as Oregonians that in 2020, the newest Oregon State Park was designated Exploding Whale Park. It's in Florence. It's got really, really cool geology as well because the river comes in. You can see dunes where the river meets the ocean. It's this super cool mix, lovely place to kind of sit and contemplate past events in Oregon. Another great part with tying this in is this is the Eugene baseball team, normally the Emeralds, but last year, 2023, they released a alter ego with uniforms, hats, and this new logo of the exploding whales. It apparently 10 times their revenue of their merch. <laughs> so there is actually talk of the emeralds permanently becoming the exploding whales, which like, I really, really hope so. I will say we did in fact learn what not to do, to quote that news reporter, from the 1970 incident. Because unfortunately, the worst stranding in the history of Oregon in terms of number of whales was only nine years later. In 1979, 41 sperm whales beached themselves in Florence. I don't know why that's... We don't really understand why whales beach themselves. Again, there's a shocking amount we don't know about animals that are alive here today. Many of the whales were still alive at the time they became beached, and so groups from a bunch of different environmental organizations as well as local volunteers set up bucket brigades to try and keep the sperm whales moist and tried to, here they are attaching ropes to try and pull some of them back out into the surf. The couple of whales they were actually able to pull back out promptly beached themselves again. Oh. Because there were 41 whales, what they did was uh, still slightly questionable, but the highway department dumped kerosene on them and burned them, and then buried the remains of that. At least it wasn't exploded. Normally, we don't have strandings of this kind of scale, but on average, somewhere on the Oregon coast, there is at least one stranding a year. Often it's smaller whales, sometimes it's in very remote areas that we don't even necessarily hear about. This is something that will continue to happen, but has also happened throughout our history. So the one I drove up to see, that one was sad, it was hit by a boat. But this is also how we're going to get a lot of the fossil whales that I'll talk about a little bit later in the talk. Now for me, growing up in the Pacific Northwest, I'm originally from Washington State, even though I spent a ton of time in Oregon growing up. For me, when I think of whales of the Oregon coast, exploding whale is awesome, but to me that was a close second to Keiko. 
I was a kid watching Free Willy and getting to go to the aquarium and get to see Keiko. And lots of discussions can be had about that. Uh, Keiko is the only captive orca that a release has been attempted. It unfortunately was ultimately a huge failure. So Keiko died within a couple months of being permanently released. An attempt was made. But certainly an iconic part of our Oregon history as well. But really our history as people and ties to whales go a lot deeper on the Oregon coast. Whales form this very crucial part of a lot of indigenous cultures locally. Uh, I grew up out on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington and one of my absolute favorite gems if you are ever out in very far on the peninsula in Nia Bay is the Macaw Indian Tribes Museum. One of the amazing artifacts is a life-sized carved cedar and all of the little white bits on here are individual elk teeth that were embedded into this. And there's a lot of art and material that records the presence of a lot of different kinds of whales in the area. The oldest uh, Western illustration of anything happening in Coos Bay is actually this 1856 uh, lithograph that was made for a East Coast newspaper of some guys riding around on Coos Bay and finding a probably humpback whale that had been either landed or beached that was being butchered and processed. So whales were not only this cultural aspect featured in a lot of art, but many, not all, some cultures along our Pacific coast also used whales as a really important resource to eat. But I wanna bring this back to geology, a indigenous connection between whales and geology. We know when the last big one earthquake happened, Cascadia Megathrust earthquake, largely because of indigenous oral traditions. And this is something that has too often been ignored in traditional Western science. People know what goes on in the environment around them. We've been really good at documenting the world around us for tens of thousands of years. It's important. With many variations all along the Pacific coast are really cool traditions about Thunderbird and whale. And my favorite story uh, that features very heavily in some of our Oregon coast uh, tribes is the story of Thunderbird and whale having one of their fairly intense fights. So Thunderbird goes to attack whale and isn't doing very well fighting whale in the ocean because that's whale's element. So Thunderbird grabs whale and tries to bring whale inland, but whale thrashes around and just after they have crossed over the beach, whale drops out of Thunderbird's claws and hits the beach, shaking the earth. This woke up everyone who noticed this was in the middle of the night, just after midnight, on the first full moon of the after the shortest year, or night of the year, or longest night of the year. So we have the exact day and time of when this earthquake happened. And the other key part that then comes in after this is whale's not gonna stay on the beach. Whale gets back into the ocean, and then because Thunderbird is smug and thinks he's won this particular battle, whale hits the water with his tail, causing a huge wave to come up on land a little bit after the earthquake. So you have the tsunami that hit, as well as the initial earthquake that caused it. A lot of our Oregon coast tribes also have legends about the whale rocks. When white colonial settlers came here, they sort of said, eh, that's a silly story, they're rocks, you can't move rocks. Actually, you can if you have a really, really, really big earthquake that changes the elevation of the coastline, sometimes by multiple meters at a time. So a lot of these whale rocks were either pushed up or dropped down and exposed in this last large earthquake. So the whale rocks date to this story about Thunderbird and whale, and they are this evidence of whale in our last Cascadia megathrust earthquake. 
Okay, now let's get into the fossils. So this is the really, really past part. I always tell my students, I kind of like using past, really past, as opposed to numbers a lot of times, because how many numbers can you actually remember in your head? I ask my students to try and picture individual dots to think about a, a number. Well, studies actually say that after about 15, your brain is just like, there are more. <laughs> there are a lot more. The problem is when I'm talking about geology and paleontology, I might be talking about millions. That's really beyond our human brain's ability to neatly comprehend. So just think of this as really, really old, and we're in the millions of years category. If we look back into this fossil record, Oregon is one of the best places in the world for studying some really key parts in the story of how do we get the whales that we have today. This is a screenshot from a very cool online database that is called the Paleobiology Database. It has an interactive map that you can look at particular ages. You can also narrow it down by particular groups of organisms. So I put in Cetacea, our whale family. And each one of these spots represents places where there are scientifically published fossil whales found in Oregon. I emphasize the published, because there's really a lot more of them, and this is sadly not an area that's super well studied, despite this incredible record. Our one major publication on whales that features some from Coos Bay and a little ways down the coast it's awesome, it was published by OSU in 1947. There's not been an update since then on any of these whales. I would like to change that. And this is where my new research I'm kicking off locally is gonna come in. We have a very creatively named fossil locality right here in the edge of Coos Bay called Fossil Point. If you've driven to Charleston and you see the Dairy Queen and you go just past the Dairy Queen, there's a little road that says Fossil Point. It's the kind of projection of rock that sticks off there. At low tide, there's a whole bunch of super cool fossils. The site was originally found 1920s and 30s by John C. Merriam, a famous paleontologist out of Berkeley, California. And so now our main study of it, uh, many of the publications, the limited publications, use this University of California Museum of Paleontology. Wait a minute, this is Oregon. We have our own universities with fossil collections. Like, go back to California. <laughs> Little bit of spice there. Even though we've known about this for over 100 years, and major paleontologists like John C. Merriam have collected here, almost none of the material from Fossil Point is published. One of the recent exceptions is three years ago, a fossil basking shark was published. Now, most of the fossils I'm talking about in this talk are bones. What's the problem with sharks in that? Cartilage. Turns out you can occasionally fossilize cartilage, which is one of the reasons why this is such a super cool site. Most of the time for sharks, the only part of a shark that you get fossilized is the teeth. We have to figure out what the whole rest of the shark looked like from teeth. Except for places like Fossil Point. So this is three different vertebrae, and then the really cool, although it doesn't look like much, these are the parts of the gill structures. So this is part of how we can tell this was a basking shark, because they're the ones that gape their mouths open really far to eat plankton. They're super weird looking. We have a fossil one from Coos Bay. There has also been a little bit of a local celebrity from Fossil Point. In 2007, the North American Research Group, a group of uh, amateur paleontologists, excavated what became known as Wally the Whale. 
This was the initial part that was exposed of Wally the Whale. Uh, it's not super pretty. This is the dark secret of field paleontology. All of this sort of chunky bit sticking out here is part of the skull. This is the very back of the skull where the spinal column would have come in. The eyes would have sat sort of about like this. And the sort of nosy part sticking out the front of the whale goes that way. The catch is this is really, really, really hard rock. So what they had to do is bring in rock saws and jackhammers and a whole lot of industrial equipment and make this huge excavation, cover it in plaster and a bunch of two by fours to help hold it together, and then use heavy equipment to winch it out. It is, unfortunately, despite having been collected in 2007, uh, not described or identified or published or on display. Hopefully someday. And it gets worse, because it turns out we have a lot of questions that aren't super answered about Fossil Point. That main publication looking at Fossil Point, 1947, our technology for telling how old rocks are, telling a lot of things about geology, in fact, having plate tectonics postdates that publication. Plate tectonics was not an accepted theory until the 1960s. So when we go out to the far edge of Fossil Point, here is one of our SWAC students, Michael Stone, wandering around on the geology. It's full of all of these shells in this top layer. And then we have this really, really sharp line and totally different rocks below it. This is the low tide mark where people go out and find the scallop fossils, dig up clams and the parts that have sediment. Wally the whale comes out of this part there's whales in this part, too. As a geologist, unless we do a whole bunch of fancy, often very expensive chemistry, to look at things like radioactive elements to date rocks, all we can say is that this is on top and this is on bottom. The bottom one is older than the top one. Do we know how much time happened in between these? I mean, that's a really, really sharp line. We have no idea. So what I am currently working with some geologists from the University of Oregon on is we think we sort of know how old this one is, mostly based on the whales that have been found on it, 15 to 16 million years old. But how old is this part? Previously, people just said, eh, you know, it's right on top of this, probably like about the same age, right? Well, one of the geologists at University of Oregon actually thinks that this, because it's got big, big chunks in it, it's full of shells, it's got boulders that are ripped up in it, it's way more energy to move those big rocks than it is to move really fine green sand. This might be a Cascadia tsunami deposit. If it is, it's a lot younger. It might be as young as only a million or two years old. To, to a geologist, practically nothing. So the question is, how old is it? Well, I found a whale in it. I went out with the two geologists to PhD holding at the edge of retirement age geologists that have global experience blow me out of the water in terms of their prestige. And the two of them walk out on the fossil point, and I'm like, you stepped on a whale. <laughs> it's not pretty, though, to give them their, their dues. So this brown bits that we can just barely see with the kind of like slight polka dot texture, right where my hand is there, that's the cross section through bone. That's the bone marrow cavity being exposed. So if you imagine taking a whale skull, sinking it into cement, and then taking a grinder to one side of it, that's effectively all we can really see at this point. It's not quite enough for me to tell what kind of whale beyond it's a baleen whale, given the shape of its skull. So one of the hopeful projects of the coming year is when I get permits, since this one is still solidly in the rock, I need Oregon Department of Transportation permits is to figure out how to get this out of the rock. 
and to a place where we can remove the rock slowly. But there's lots of very cool fossils coming out of here. This is a baby dolphin vertebra that I also found at Fossil Point next to some fossil wood. It's this really, really cool area that has not had a lot of scientific attention. Now we're gonna take the history of studying fossil whales back a little bit further in Oregon's time. Thomas Condon is one of the coolest people in Oregon history that most of you probably never heard of. Thomas Condon was born in 1822 in Ireland and his family moved to upstate New York. In upstate New York, he had two career paths that he basically kind of couldn't decide between and that was okay at the time. He therefore got a degree studying geology in the early history of the SUNY college system, as well as became an ordained minister. As a minister and a geologist, he came up with a really cool way to combine these, to become a traveling minister so that he could basically travel around and find fossils. The catch is people have been living in New York for quite a long time and had kind of found a lot of the fossil places. So he wanted to go have adventure and find new things that nobody had seen before. So in uh, 1852, he moved to Oregon and basically took Oregon by storm in terms of geology and paleontology. He was the first person to really start mapping out where do we have different kinds of rocks? Where do we have different geologic features? Where are there cool fossils in Oregon? This brought him to the attention of the state government, and in 1872, he was appointed the first state geologist of Oregon. He held that position until he voluntarily resigned to become the first science faculty member at University of Oregon. Let's go Ducks. At University of Oregon, he used the platform of having a museum to store everything in to found the first fossil collection in Oregon. The core of the University of Oregon fossil collection, which is the largest in the state, and the federal designated repository for fossils found on federal lands, uh, is still centered around what's now called the Condon Collection. These are sort of special fossils that still have Condon's handwriting and Condon's labels on them. Uh, on the show and tell, you can see afterwards, I actually have a book that belonged to Thomas Condon. It says Condon, none of you can really see that. But like, a real Condon book. You always getting rid of it, it was in a free pile. Not anymore. So let's tie this back into Wales though. Our first paleontologist, geologist, University of Oregon science faculty member. He was also the first one to find fossil whales in Oregon. He reported finding uh, little bits of bone sticking out of rock at low tide around Newport. And he dug a small chunk out and drew a map of where that piece of whale fossil was from. The catch was the rocks were really, really hard and he didn't really want to bother with that. So it went back to University of Oregon, had whale question mark written on it, I've seen it, and it sat there for decades. Uh, his field notes were not always great. So while we know where it's from, we don't know exactly when it was collected, probably sometime in the 1890s. So we're gonna have to go forward about 30 years, and in 1920, uh, one of University of Oregon's subsequent paleontologists is digging through the collections and is like, there's a chunk of whale, and I can tell Condon broke the edge of it, getting it out of the rock. I wonder if the rest of it's still there. So they go out to Newport and find, basically directly under the north side of the bridge today at low tide, a whale skull. And I don't want to know how hard it was to get an entire whale skull out of the rock in 1920, but they did and brought it back to University of Oregon. Here is most of it in an old display. This is the kind of snout of the whale. There's the main part of the skull. Uh, there's parts of flippers. There's a bunch of toe bones and an ear. The ear will be important later. 
to try and preserve it, because we as paleontologists didn't really know any better in the early 1900s, they sank it into plaster. Plaster degrades over time. And some of the chemical reactions that can happen with plaster mean that sometimes it ends up harder, but brittle, compared to the fossil around it. So fast forward all the way back to me being in grad school at University of Oregon. The uh, Hatfield Marine Center up the coast, OSU's Marine Biology Center, contacts us and are like, you have cofacetus. And we're like, yep. And they're like, we want a exact replica, a cast of cofacetus. And we're like, oh no, that sounds terrible. Because it's large. Like, this chunk that we had to move several times as grad students is about as long as I am tall. Set in plaster with some paint and crumbling bits of bone coming out of it. So our first order we realize we have to do is repair the plaster and get rid of the plaster if we can, come up with better ways to sort of hold this together. So one of the things that was done was we went to one of the hospitals in Eugene after hours and stuffed this in a CT machine. <laughs> this gave us a chance to make this really cool 3D image of the snout part to see what was actually bone and what was plaster and what parts they had painted plaster to look like the bone. <laughs> That's where this gets really bad because the reason why cofacetus is so important, besides being the first fossil whale named from Oregon, is that it is the oldest known baleen whale. Paleontologists, when they're trying to figure out family trees, look at really fiddly details of shapes and measurements to figure out where things fit in the tree. And it turns out a bunch of the things that were being measured were actually plaster. <laughs> It was also, did I mention it's large? Uh, this is an attempt originally to make a resin cast of it. The catch is this part of the skull that we were trying to make a mold of is about this wide and this long. And I was the tallest of the grad students. I'm not very tall. And so my friend Megan and I slapped this together with resin and sort of did this and there's a lot of resin on the floor in a lab at University of Oregon that I know nothing about. <laughs> and we'll come back to cofacetus and the problem of where it fits in a moment. So the cool thing with cofacetus is, again, oldest baleen whale. Back to whales are really weird. Whales either have teeth or they have this structure called baleen that are these long fibrous plates made out of the same material as your fingernails. Not great because that doesn't fossilize. It's pretty soft. We have almost no actual baleen fossils. But the shape of the skull where the baleen attaches in, we can see that. So we can still tell when whales are baleen in the fossil record, even if we don't know exactly what their baleen looked like. Where this gets really weird, though, is the ancestor whales all have teeth. So when we start to get the branch going to baleen, no teeth, and teeth, the earliest baleen whales have teeth. And they are trying to do the things that baleen whales do, like filter krill, out of the water with teeth. Thus we get some of the more horrifying looking beasties, like these lovely friends from uh, the Carolinas. These are about five million years older than our whales we have here on the Oregon coast. And they were sort of trying to go for like Swiss army knife combo, just get it done teeth. So in the front, they have sharp pointy stabby teeth or bite onto fish, eat fish. In the back, they have these really weird leaf flake teeth so that they could suck in a bunch of water and sort of make a really terrifying grin, force the water out and maybe catch the krill on the inside of their teeth. There's some weird seals that do this today, which is why we're pretty sure what this is what they were doing. But at some point, whales are like, you know what? The teeth are just not worth the effort. 
we're gonna go with the very, very, very strange baleen structures. But figuring out exactly when that happens is complicated. Those fun toothy whales from the Carolinas, we have a gap in time. And then Oregon is where we really pick up the story with Cophacetus that is definitely a baleen whale. What exactly is happening in between them? I really like this literal version of the family tree of whales because we've got our big split up here of mysticetes, baleen whales, odontocete, toothed whales, and there's some things sort of <laughs> in the middle there. Whales are really weird. Like when, when our end result is something like sperm whales and right whales and gray whales and orcas, like even the middle is very, very, very strange. So hopefully you got this as one of my big take homes. I just wanna run through a few more fossil whales because they're fun and weird. This is our 2023 uh, my personal picks on my favorite two brand new fossil whales. In uh, fall, a fossil whale was published that, um, gosh, I don't even really know what to say about it, complimentary. <laughs> it's, it's really big. And just, yeah, it's like a slug whale, like, like very, very tiny head and and it's, it's even bizarre the more you get to think about it. So this is a vertebra. Like, vertebra don't look like that. Any of you in nursing, you know, think of a human vertebra? Like, no, that's wrong. It should not look like that. Their ribs are going to get weirder and worse. Our ribs have bone marrow in the inside. Bone marrow is useful for making things like blood cells. They don't have marrow cavities. Their bones are solid, except back of the skull in their neck. So presumably this giant animal made all of its bone marrow in its like head, which manatees do that today, so we know it can be done. And they have these solid bones, probably to make them heavier, to feed along the bottom. Really weird. And then in my description, I promised murder dolphins. This is my new favorite murder dolphin. This is coming out of slightly younger rocks also in the Carolinas. So this is a similar age to some of the dolphins that we have here on the Oregon coast. From the side, looks not too terrifying. That's basically what a dolphin skull looks like. But this is the end of its snout. Those are teeth. Multiple inch long giant spiky teeth that stick out like danger spatulas. What are you doing with that? Anyways, for previously known, but my favorite really, really, really weird fossil whales is Leviathan. So Leviathan, as the name implies, it was hinting at biblical sea monster. I think that's actually a pretty good fit for this. It is a type of sperm whale, except for it had teeth on both top and bottom. And it has the lovely claim to fame of excluding tusks, which are things like elephant tusks mostly for show, teeth used directly for biting. These are the largest biting teeth of any mammal ever. The largest leviathan teeth found are 16 inches long. Those are really big teeth. Like T-Rex even had banana-sized teeth, but like that's bigger than a banana. What makes this, to me, even cooler, as someone who really, really likes mammals, is one of the other critters known from these same deposits as most of our leviathan fossils is Megalodon, the largest shark to have ever lived. Guess what one's bigger? Guess what one might have eaten Megalodon? Go mammals. There is also a tiny little broken bit of a tooth that has been tentatively assigned to possibly being Leviathan from the Oregon coast. So we might have had these in Oregon, which is awesome. Although reasons not to time travel. 
And then back into whales are really weird. Uh, several times in whale history, they've done the experiment of what if we got really long? I don't know why, but like really long. Scary teeth, okay, there's our normal ones. Uh, these ones I really like. We've done a bunch of scary teeth. How about no teeth? This is a toothless dolphin and their entire body fossils are about this long. So toothless miniature dolphins. And just last little bit of candy for fun things on the Oregon coast. I love the whales, the whales are awesome, but the whales also had some really weird friends. One of the coolest weirdo fossils of the Oregon coast are desmostylids. That's their fancy scientific name. The best we have for a common name is sea hippo, which I think sort of sells them short, because if you picture a hippo, scary, large animal, actually the most dangerous animal in Africa and kills the most people, make it bigger, take the hind legs and stick them kind of on the side, and then give it the weirdest teeth ever. This is a single molar from one of these sea hippos, and it basically has these like giant stacks of Cheerios for teeth. This is the thickest enamel any animal ever has produced. Thicker than elephant enamel. <laughs> Why? We also have the claim to fame of that the West Coast is not great for megalodon sharks, but the only complete megalodon tooth known from the actual coast is from Oregon. So we did have megalodon out here. They're not common. Alas, it's not like Florida. We're not gonna go pick them up on the beach all the time. But so we had giant sharks swimming around eating some of our weird fossil whales. And again, they're large. We also have basking sharks, a bunch of very strange ratfish. They're kind of fun, cute, if you like weird things. Really cool record here on the coast. And so with that, I wanna say thank you so much. Uh, for those of you watching online or from Curry, I have a way to answer questions if you type them into the chat as well, but so questions from the audience or questions from online. Oh, we, we have a microphone. We'll start with you. You're next. Where, where does the uh, beluga, I always thought it was a beluga whale, but it's, poor, it's a more of a porpoise or? You asked a very dangerous loaded question. <laughs> so it turns out belugas and narwhals, we know they're really closely related. They actually occasionally make weird crosses. They're really, really, really weird. So they don't have teeth, except for when they're very newborn babies. They produce teeth in their jaws that then get reabsorbed into their jaws. And there's a bit of debate on if they are pulled out teeth genes from the baleen whales or if they're actually normal toothed whales. See the first question, the stumper. Okay, you talked about whales um, vertically in the water. I thought that's how they slept. That's one of our hypotheses. Uh -huh. But there's You're not sure. a fairly recent, some very brave person went and did a bunch of ac acoustic recording. And when they see the sperm whales like that, they're using a really low frequency sound. So they do seem to be talking while they're doing that. So maybe they're sleep talking? <laughs> so just out of curiosity, you got any more of these things planned in the future? Oh, yes, thank you for the, so late March, the exact date to be finalized, hopefully very soon, we will have University of Oregon's Dr. Marley Miller, who is the author of Roadside Geology of Oregon, coming to give a talk. She's also a professional photographer, so it'll be really, really, really pretty. And then later in the spring, we will have Eric Scott, who is one of the world experts on Ice Age horses and bison. So here's one from online. Hey, Wynn, Stan here. I'm writing this 20 minutes in, so please disregard, sorry. But uh, why did whale evolution so large sizes, high masses? 
Ah, that's a great question. Basically, why do whales get so big? So during our age of dinosaurs, turns out most dinosaurs not actually swimming. There's lizardy things that go to sea that aren't dinosaurs, and they're really big, and then they all die with the dinosaurs. So basically, it's free real estate, that there is this enormous bounty and resources of the ocean, and sharks coming out of the age of dinosaurs are actually pretty small, because there were things that were eating the sharks. So whales go back to the sea very early on in the age of mammals because it's this enormous resource that doesn't have big predators. And then the advantage to being big is if you're big enough, it's hard for other things to eat you. Um, so this question will take a second to ask. So I know there's like a maximum sized animal you can get. But what do you think the likelihood that, let's say, we go into like an ice age or something, that there could be an even larger whale? Or do you think it'll probably be that blue whales will be the biggest and they'll die off? I think it's very likely that there are bigger whales in the fossil record that we haven't found. And it's, it is very linked to climate. So typically in colder water, colder air, the bigger you are, the more efficient your body size to surface area and loss of heat is. And the great thing about the oceans and being a giant whale is you can eat plankton. So it doesn't matter that you're quite as big, you don't need to support yourself, the water does it, you have an abundant food resource. I think it's totally possible that we could have had bigger whales and we could get bigger whales. I have a question. But it helps with our... our okay. um, in, in the Sahara Desert, they find whales that are far inland, and I understand uh, the causal reason why that they find them there. Uh, do we have that incident occurring in the Oregon area because the, the sea coastal mountains are fairly new? Mostly no. So most of Oregon is just geologically so young, stuff kind of getting scraped off on the side of the coast. But we actually do have a couple fossil whales from the Willamette Valley. So during various times of warmer climate, higher sea level, the Willamette Valley was ocean. It would have been a huge bay coming in. So there's a couple places. And I think that likely there's a lot more out there, but the unfortunate catch with the, the Willamette Valley is that dirt rolls downhill. And so stuff gets really buried. And unless people dig really, really large holes, it's harder to find the fossils there. Every single time University of Oregon builds a new building, they let the geologists go have like two days in the, when they first dig it out. It's really cool. Are there any uh, numbers on how many blue whales go by Oregon? No. And you didn't mention anything about pilot whales. Yeah, they're rare. They're not super common. I think we saw some out of Depot Bay tuna fishing. Uh, that's why I was left there waiting for you to say something. They're recorded, but I mean, again, they're super rare. And, and you know, it's overall, this kind of brings me back to, I thought when I got into science that there were so many things we'd figured out with modern animals. And then it would be really easy to say, okay, this is what the modern animals do. What do the fossil ones do? Yet we don't even know that much about the modern ones. Is there a specific time of year for the blue whales? No. Okay. Uh, we actually see them in Bandon in uh, uh, August, the first part of August. They seem to be traveling through. And the fishermen seem to see big groups of uh, shrimp yeah. uh, when they're uh, coming through. Well, and one thing that's interesting with the blue whales is there's some little bit of data that kind of like a very, very, very distant relative, the orcas, they might have both migratory populations and resident populations. Anybody else? Um, I recently read about the orcas and the moms taking care of the boys for so long. Do you think that's why Keiko may have perished? Ooh, so th this is like personal opinion time here. The, the first huge mistake made with Keiko was, Keiko was actually captured off of Greenland by non-US parties, and then eventually ended up being housed at the Oregon Coast Aquarium because they were like, oh God, we could, I guess. 
so the first thought when people were like, let's release Keiko, is they built this big pen on the Oregon Ocean, and we're like, you can talk to the other whales. And it turns out he can't. Because whales have dialects. They have different languages. So then they actually transported him all the way over to Greenland and built a new pen. But I think a huge part of the issue was he was in captivity for so long and caught fairly darn young that he sort of didn't have the social skills. Like effectively the audio recordings of him are him being like, hey, 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 hey. And the other whales are like, God, no. <laughs> Which is a really sad ending to that, but. Hey, this is another online from Greg Ryder. As the continents and ocean changed, were whales moving around? Are fossils of the same species found in different parts of the world now? That's a great question. So yes, tectonics play a really big deal. Uh, the, the Pacific Ocean is a really key point for a lot of major turning points in whale history, and yet it's not as well studied as a lot of our sites on the Atlantic. And I think that's a big part of our problem is that when a lot of this paleontology first started being done, people were like, look, the continents are there, huzzah. And the story is a little more complicated than that. How do you get whales back and forth between different continents or off the coast of continents? How many fossils do you find every year? Ooh, that's a great question. If I get to go to Kyrgyzstan, the answer is usually a lot. One of the sites that I go to in Kyrgyzstan, which I got to go to this last summer, uh, when it floods and you get like a log jam, it's effectively that, but with bones. So just solid bones. Oh, Kyrgyzstan, so if here's China, it sits right on the northwest corner of China. It's Central Asia, entirely landlocked, about the same size as Nebraska. Unfortunately, it's also the most earthquake prone country in the world, which is why I'm there, digging up fossils, figuring out what the fossils are, and using that to figure out how old the rocks are. This is this last summer, and this is a rhino jaw. So there's the top of the jaw, and there's the very large pointy tusk at the end of the jaw. <laughs> 280 million years ago. Any other questions? So is that, is that when, they, when they found the whales, when they first found the whales about 280 million years ago? The oldest whales are about 55 million years ago. So basically the, the silly giant dinosaurs get out of the way and whales are like, yeah, this looks good. And very quickly sort of figure out how to be large whales. I honestly thought that the question about how many fossils you were gonna say not enough. <laughs> I don't know, I had to package all of those fossils and mail them from Kyrgyzstan. And it turns out mailing rocks is expensive. And I, so I don't want more. And I noticed in the, in the film, this is kind of a joke, I don't know if anybody's gonna really like it, but there was a Geraldo. What does Geraldo Rivera think about that? <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming out tonight. And you can say that, but it's my pleasure to pass the torch and with some of the folks that you've told me about in the not too distant and the slightly distant future, I'm really looking forward to the future. And I have at the table at the corner some whale fossils and whale bones out, so y'all should come look at them on the way out. Thank you.